Okay, well, we wait for everybody to file in and grab a seat. I just want to kind of get an idea of who I've got in the audience today. So we're just going to go around and everybody introduce themselves. How many back-end developers do I have in the room? How many front-end developers? How many designers? Managers? Security experts? Did anybody raise their hand for everything? Anybody doing full stack? All of you need to come to the talk that we're doing at the after party tonight. All of you. Um, you, will, you will get a kick out of that one then. Okay, so we've got a bit of a mix uh, in here, but mostly back-end developers from, from what I can see. So hopefully I can show you a little bit about what's going on in the front end today. Um, just give it a... Okay. We might get started then. Okay. So for those of you who don't know me, which is most of you, my name's Amy. I'm hoping you managed to get at least that much seeing as you're in my talk. And I've come all the way from Perth. Yes, I took the direct flight that is just under 18 hours on a plane all the way to London, which was kind of, everybody keep ask, keeps asking me what it was like. It was like, well, it was good because we, when we got off the plane, we were here, but also that was a really, really long way to go. Um, so, not sure I can recommend it to anybody if you wanted to come and visit us in Perth, but it, it wasn't too bad um, and it's really exciting to be here. I'm just hoping, so I got in at five o'clock on Tuesday morning and one of the other speakers from Perth had her talk yesterday about halfway through her talk, she just went, whoa, my jet lag just hit me. So I'm really hoping I managed to get through my talk today without that happening. Uh, it's also really exciting to be back in London, I was here at NDC last year, so it's really exciting to get to come back. And the thing is, like, I realized the weather's pretty much the same here. I mean, I left Perth and it was 39 degrees, and now it's 329 degrees. So that's pretty much the same thing, right? As I said, I was here last year, and it's really exciting to, to get to come back, because last year at NDC, I talked about CSS Grid, and it was my first international conference, my first NDC, and I had an amazing experience. The audience here was incredible and there was a lot of support, despite the fact that I, so when I introduced myself, I thought I said that it was an honor to be there and turns out I actually told the audience it was on, an honor for them to have me there. <laughs> It's my second conference ever, but you know, it's an honor for you all to have me here today. <laughs> um, so it's really excited that I got to come back, um, despite the fact that apparently I have a massive ego. As I said, I come from Perth. I'm a freelance front-end developer, which means that I spend a lot of the time at the beach and the rest of the time I work at home in my pajamas. I'm also heavily involved in the Perth tech community. I help run a user group for front-end developers. I'm on the committee for DDD Perth, which is a community conference that we organize and the biggest, conference, the biggest tech conference in Perth. I also work as an evangelist for Yao Conferences, which is a tech conference in Australia, Singapore, and Hong Kong. Last year, I also became a Twilio champion and a Microsoft MVP. I also have a beautiful gray and white border collie who likes to sit next to me at my desk when I work and tends to get very upset every time that I go away. Got very upset when my suitcase came out despite the fact that he actually loves the kennel. We turn up and he bolts out of the car and races inside. But today I'm here to talk to you about testing, specifically testing on the front end. Now, we all know that testing is important. That's never really been a question. But although there's a lot of debate about whether you should be writing your code or your tests first, we even have a software process around how this is done. 
Most people aren't asking if they're testing the front end. We have a lot of strong opinions, but none of them seem to be based around making sure that our front end is being tested. And the thing is, the front end is something that matters as well, because that's what our users are looking at. To me, I feel like this comes down to the fact that there's so many different tests that we need to be running on the front end. Accessibility testing, performance testing, user testing, HTML validation, regression testing. It's often hard to work out what you need to test and even where to start, particularly if you haven't come from a testing background. So if I'm here today standing up and telling you all about testing, that must mean I'm an expert, right? No. Six months ago, the only testing I could do was running the NPM script for starting the Cypress test that somebody else had set up for me. I don't have a testing background. I have very short experience in testing. But when I got started, I found that a lot of the time there was assumed knowledge around running front-end testing. I've only just gone through the process of learning this. So for anybody who isn't familiar with testing, I've just been through where you are now. And that was something that I thought was really useful because I was able to have that different perspective because I've come through with pro, no prior knowledge. So today I'm assuming no prior knowledge with testing because I wanna make sure that I get through to everybody in the room about how you can get started with front-end testing, even if you haven't done any of it before. So we're gonna start off today with linting. Now, I know linting isn't technically testing, but it's a very important part of the development process. Now, if you're not familiar with it, linting is a type of automated check that happens early on in development and checks for and sometimes fixes programmatic and stylistic errors. So whether or not you want to have a semicolon at the end of every function, whether you've got gaps between functions, how many lines you have as a gap, whether or not you're using tabs or spaces. Come on, we all know tabs is the right answer here. There's a lot of different tools out there for linting. But today I'm going to be running through using two of them, which is ESLint, which is JavaScript test, JavaScript linting tool, and StyleLint, which is for CSS and the various forms of styles. So we're gonna start off something nice and easy, and we're going to install ESLint in our project. And then the live demo is going to work seamlessly. Okay. So we're gonna start off, I've installed everything ahead of time because we all know what happens when you try and install node modules on conference Wi-Fi. We'll be here forever. And to start off, I'm gonna create a file in my project. Now this project, just so you can get an idea of what we're testing, we're testing a blog, something nice and simple and has a few different features that we can test. This blog I've built with a platform called Eleventy which is a static site generator. So I'm not using frameworks. This is pretty much just HTML and CSS that I'm testing on today. To start off today, we're going to create a file to let ESLint know what I want it to check for. So I'm gonna create an ESLint file and my snippets are going to work. Oh, come on. We're giving it one more shot. I did a practice of this last week and absolutely everything went wrong. So I was kind of hoping that that was enough. I made my sacrifices to the demo gods this morning. I found a couple of squirrels on the way here. Hoping that was enough for today. Okay, so for our ESLint file to start off, we have three parts of our file. First is extends. This allows you to extend pre-configured uh, settings that other people use. This is really useful when you're getting started. If you don't know what you wanna test for, you can start from somebody else's starter pack. Uh, so I'm using the Airbnb base because they have a pretty good starter 
starter pack uh, to, to get you started with the linting. You can also include any plugins that you want to use depending on what languages that you're using. I'm not going to include any today. Then you can also set your own rules and these rules will override any of the, the configurations that you're extending. So I am going to include a couple of rules that I don't like the way Airbnb does things. Um, so this is going to, to set things up. All I have to do then is run ESLint in my project. And what, this, what I'm telling ESLint to do here with this function is I'm telling it to run ESLint. I'm using a fix command which says that if there's anything it can automatically fix, I want it to go through and fix them. So things like trailing commas and semicolons and stuff like that, I want it to automatically fix that. Uh, I also then want it to output all of the results to a JSON file, which I'm putting in a tests folder, and I want it to format that as JSON data. Um, now, I'm getting an error here because there's probably something wrong with my code. And if I have a look inside the tests folder here, the JSON file and format it so that you can actually read it, I have quite a few tests in here. And if we have a look, this will go through and it will tell me the file path that my error is in. So is, is, are people at the back able to read that? Is that big enough? Yeah. Okay, so it will tell me the file path and it tells me what I'm getting an issue with. And so here it says that there is an unexpected console statement. It's because I've got a setting in ESLint that says that I want it to tell me about any console logs so I don't forget to get rid of them at the end of my file, at the end of my project before pushing. So I go through and if I can find this file here, css.js, I can see here this has given me a error on this console log here because it says that my settings say I don't want to have any of those console logs. Now I'm not going to do, I'm not going to go too in depth into all of this today because there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ESLint settings and we would be here forever and still not get past the whether or not we should use tabs or spaces. So um, if you want to have a look, ESLint has a list of all of their rules and absolutely all of the settings that you can run with them there. Next, we're going to set up linting for my CSS because ESLint is, is limited on what it can do with the CSS files. And we're going to start off going npm install style lint, which is the CSS linting tool that I'm using. And I'm going to create a file for that one too. That's not what I want. I'm going to create a file for that one too, which is a style lint file. Now, similar to ESLint, uh, with StyleLint, you can set up extends, rules. They also have various processes that you can use. I'm not using any of that today. Uh, you can also set up custom syntax, which I need to use because I'm not actually using CSS files in my project. I'm using SAS files. So I need to let it know that I'm using uh, SCSS files. That way, it will know the various different syntax that I'm using there. And I also have a bunch of different rules that I've gone through. Yes, I did actually go through every single style lint rule and decide which ones I cared enough about that I wanted to use. I was really, really bored over the Christmas break. So I'm not going to go through all of the different rules that I have here today. But if we have a look at one of my SAS files, um, let's say my content file, one of my rules says that I only want to have one line between each of the property function, between each of the function declarations in my SAS file. Now, if I add some extra files here, what I also have pre-installed is I actually have a style lint extension in VS Code, 
which it will, is going to give me an output at the bottom. So you can do this with ESLint as well, rather than continually running the function, you can have an extension in your IDE, which will continue to let you know when there are errors. So we can have a look here, and it says that it expected no more than one empty line. And if I go through and remove those, my errors have disappeared. So that means when I'm going through and writing my code, it's gonna get rid of a lot of the silly errors that I might make and, and pick them up, which will mean that my tests that I build later on are picking up the actual things that I'm broken, I've broken. Similar to ESLint, StyleLint has a list of all of their rules, so you can go through and have a look at them there. Next, we're gonna get started with some testing, and first off, I'm going to look at accessibility testing. Now, accessibility testing covers a lot of various different things, including validating HTML, checking for alt tags on images, looking at color contrast, and making sure that technologies like screen readers or reader modes uh, are able to process the information we have in our applications. That also includes things like Google Home and other voice assistants. <coughs> so there are a lot of different testing tools out there that you can use. Today I'm using a tool called Pally, which is a set of open source tools that have a lot of different options and today I'm going to be using their main tool, which is a command line interface that I'm able to run with my application. But they also have other tools, including they have a CI tool that you can integrate with your uh, continuous integration systems. And they also have dashboards and things that you can use if there's any non-technical people in the team who wanna see continuous results as things have changed over time. Now, just a little bit of information about Pally. Pally checks against Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG. And these are guidelines that have been set up by the W3C, the Web Accessibility Initiative. There's a lot of acronyms and it's hard to get them all straight. These are, Funnily enough, the web content accessibility guidelines aren't very accessible, uh, so even accessibility experts have a bit of trouble deciphering what they mean. The great thing is Pally actually takes care of all of that for us, and it will just let us know when something is wrong and how we can fix it. So we're gonna start off by installing Pally in our project, which I've already done. And first off, I'm going to create a file in my test folder called pally.js. Uh, come on. This thing's throwing tantrums again. This is why I don't do live demos. Um, there we go. Okay, so here is a simple test for just running Pally out of the box in your project. We need to require the package at the top. I have defined a function to run the test in and at the bottom I'm then running that function. Inside uh, we're doing a promise to get the results from Pally, and I'm running that against the website that I've got running locally on my computer. I'm then console logging the results out at the bottom, which you can see ESLint is already throwing tantrums about the fact that I have a console log, and my settings say that I shouldn't have them. Now, this is uh, something which runs using Puppeteer, if anybody has used that in testing before. And this is where it starts to get a little bit tricky for me uh, because I actually use WSL 
on my computer, which is a Windows subsystem of Linux. So when I try and run this on my computer, Pally thinks it's on a Linux machine and it can't find Chrome to open it because Chrome is installed on Windows. The good news is, is who have I got here who runs Windows? Oh, yay, this is so exciting. Who here uses WSL? A couple of people. It's life-changing. I highly recommend it. Um, the good news is I've done all of the hard work in finding the solutions for this. So a quick change to the basic setup. I want to require the puppeteer package. And then I want to define a, a um, a couple of settings in here, which uh, is a custom configuration of the Puppeteer browser to, to let it know where it can find my Windows version of Chrome from the Linux subsystem. I then let Pally know that it should use my custom browser options that I've defined. Now I can go through and run my Pally function. You do this by running it through node tests Pally. And what this will do is this will then go through and uh, run my Pally function that I've defined with the default settings. And this has given me a lovely, nice, easy to read thing that says I have a bunch of objects which are issues. So I know exactly what I need to fix now. Um, so as you can see there, that's not very easy to read. And even if I do format those objects properly, it's gonna be a bit difficult to read through from the console. So what I'm gonna do is I'm also going to use the node file system package. And instead of console logging my results now, I'm going to save them. What this is telling it to do is it's telling the file system to write to a file in test results called pally.json. I want to stringify the results that I'm getting to make sure that they come out as a proper JSON object. And if there's any errors, I want to log them in the console. Now, if I run my function again, this will then go through and, and look over my application with Pally again. And if I have a look in my test folder, I now have a results folder and I have a pally.json file, which if I format it, I have a nice long list of accessibility errors in my application. Now, this can be a little bit confusing to start off with, so we're gonna have a look at just the first error that I've got here. So this is the information it's given me for this issue. Uh, some of the information we can ignore, so we're just gonna have a look at these, which is the code, the type, type code, message, context, and selector. First off, we're gonna have a look at the context and selector. This lets us know where we can find the error in our application. It's telling me that it, the error is coming from an image selector, which is loading uh, an image of a lighthouse, and it tells me I can find the selector under HTML body header image. So I know where I can go and find it in my application. And that's my header image there and it's picking up that that image is where I'm getting those errors from. Now I can work out what the error that I'm getting is. And if I go through and have a look here, it's given me a bunch of codes about the error and it's given me a message which says that the image element is missing an alt attribute, use an alt attribute to specify a short text alternative, which alt text is a text-based alternative to an image so if anybody's using a screen reader, they know what the image was and so they don't miss out on the experience because they can't visually see the image on our application. Now, if we needed to know a little bit more information about this particular guideline and how we can fix it, 
It's given us the guideline number at the end of that code there, which is here. <coughs> and this has made it nice and easy for us to go and look it up. So there's a website which lists all of the WCAG guidelines and we can copy that code and search for it, which you can see here in our guideline. And so this will give us more information about the particular guideline that we're having an error on and how we can go through and fix it. Okay. Now, as I said, this is just using Pally out of the box. It has a bunch of different options that you can do. So you can define actions. So rather than it just looking at a page, you can get it to click on things and navigate around your application and be testing that. You can define specific viewports to test on various device sizes and types. You can, divide, you can define the particular WCAG standards that you're checking against. By default, it checks against the AA standards, which are fairly easy to do, but they're fairly standard. You can also check against the AAA standards, which is the kind of thing that governments have to test against. Similar to various requests, you can also send through particular data and header types if your application needs that. So we're going to go through and change some of the options that we have in our application here. And I'm going to add a couple of extra options. So I've decided that I'm going to be really strict with my application and I want it to def I want it to meet the triple A standards, which means uh, that I think it's about 3% it puts the usability of your application up to uh, about 97% of the population. And I also wanted to take a screen capture of what the application look like, looks like when it's running a test. I want to know exactly what's happening in case sometimes it's a bit confusing to work out why it's getting an error. So I've defined those options. I'm going to go through and run my tests again. And what this is going to do now is not only is it going to run the test and output the information, it's also going to give me an image. It's going to give me a screenshot about what Pally can actually see when it's running the test. So I can have a look at that and go, well, it's not really what I want my application to look like. And so it gives me a little bit more context about why it's actually getting an error because that's really not right. Something's definitely gone horribly wrong there. Now, if you've noticed in my function, I've actually also set this up. So this can take an array of promises. So rather than just running one test on one page, you can set up multiple tests. So you can test multiple pages or against multiple option settings. So if I go back here, I can also test um, this against one of my blog posts. So if I have a look at one of the blog posts I have here, I want to test it against that page. But I also want to test it against uh, mobile screen size as well as against a desktop screen size. So I'm going to go through and that's now taking a screenshot of the post. So I'm now running three tests through this which I'm going to set up to run. So I'm now running three tests. The first one is now actually checking one of the blog posts on my blog. The second one is running against the main blog page and it's checking at a mobile screen size. And the third one is testing the, mob, uh, the desktop screen size at the home page as well. And while I've done that, it's now going through and my test is finished. And if we can see on the side there, that's then gone through and I've got screenshots for each of the tests that I've run. So I can see each of the results that it's giving me, which that's really not okay 
my blog really is not very accessible right now. And if I have a look at my results, This is also giving me an array with results for each of the tests that I've run. So I can have a look at all of my results in one go. Next up, we're going to set up visual regression testing on my application, uh, which visual regression testing compares screenshots of it will take a screenshot of your application. When you make code changes, it will take another screenshot and it compares the two of them and the difference. Similar to how Git will give you a diff between the code that you've written. Today, I'm using a tool called Backstop.js. There are a bunch of different options out there. I chose Backstop because it was super easy to get started and also who doesn't love having pictures of lemurs on their computer? Like it was just fun to work with. Similar to the others, I'm going to go through and install that, but this time I'm installing it globally on my computer. This is so that I can take advantage of backstop's initialization command. I can run backstop init in my project, which I'm going to do now. And what this does is this will actually set up uh, a configuration file and a bunch of different options for me to, to get me started nice and quickly. Now, if I wait for this to finish, There we go, that's now finished the command. And I now have some extra files here. I have a folder called backstop data and a file called backstop.json. This has then given me a copy of their configuration file, all set up and ready to start running visual regression testing on my application. Now, backstop, similar to Pali, also uses Puppeteer, so I need to let it know that I want it to find the Windows version of Chrome. So I let it know where I can find that. And it's also set up here. It's got an option for scenarios where you can run through the various tests that's doing. It's given me a test against its home page, which I don't want to test that. I don't really care whether or not that one changes. So I'm going to use a test for for my blog homepage. Then I'm going to run the command backstop test. Now, while this is running, what this is then going through and doing is this is going through and completely loading up my application at Two viewport sizes, so it's testing a phone and a tablet size. It's going to take a screenshot of what it looks like in the headless browser and it will compare it with the existing screenshot. What I should expect to happen here is I actually expect my test to fail because I don't have an existing screenshot for it to compare against. So when it does finish, I will expect it to tell me that it's failed. Anybody know any good jokes? No? Here we go. And it's told me that zero of my tests have passed, two of them has failed. What it's then done is it's also created a really nice HTML report for me and it's tried to open that up in my browser, but it's had issues doing that because again, it's running on, it thinks it's running on a Linux machine, so it can't open, it can't open the can't open the report in, in my browser because it's a little bit confused. So I'm going to have to open that up manually. And if I have a look here, backstop data, HTML report, index.html, and I can open that in my browser. Oh, no. You know how it does that really good thing where it goes to the last browser you were using?
So here we go, it will show me the screenshots that it's got and it's telling me that there's an error because the reference file that it's testing against can't be found. What I can then go through and do is I can tell it that it's okay and that I approve the results that it's getting. So I want to approve the results. What it will then do is it will take the screenshots that it's taken at that test and it's, it's going to copy that in so those screenshots are going to be the new reference images. If I then go through and run that test again, it will be comparing against the original screenshots. So that should go through and pass, but I'm not going to sit there and, and wait for that to happen. We can have a look at that later. Oh wait, no, it seems to be finishing much faster. There we go. Now it's told me that two of my tests have passed, zero have failed, and if I refresh the report there, you can see there it's then comparing the two screenshots and it tells me that none of this has changed. None of this has changed words. Now, visual regression testing uh, may or may not be right for you. It can yield false results because it is comparing every single pixel to every single pixel. This may be what you're after, depending on how big your application is, or it may be a, a bit too much. For example, I often get results on my blog because the images haven't loaded in properly. So it tells me that it's changed and that's just because some of the images aren't quite there yet. Good news is there is a setting in Backstop where you can check the threshold. So you can let it know the difference that is allowed before it should fail a test. <coughs> However, that may still be a, a bit too, I want to say finickety. It may be a bit much for, for your particular use case. That's where uh, something like end-to-end -end testing may be a good alternative. So for this, I use a tool called Cypress. Anybody here use Cypress before? Anyone use Selenium? I haven't used Selenium, but everyone keeps telling me that Cypress is way better than Selenium. So hopefully that's true. So there are a lot of different options. Cypress is one of them. I mainly use Cypress because it was already set up in another project that I worked on. And if you're not familiar with testing or these kinds of applications, it may be tricky to get your head around it. So I'm going to start off installing Cypress. Uh, this one is, I still haven't actually worked out how to run this one on WSL properly, so I do just run this one on, on Windows because it can be a little bit tricky. Now, the good thing about, the good thing about Cypress is it will also give you a, a bunch of information to start with. If you run the function for Cypress open, it will actually give you which I should already have it here. No, I deleted it because I was going to start from scratch today. Okay, so if I run the command for Cypress open, what that will do is that will go through and it will give you starter setup to work with, including a bunch of examples, which I'm hoping this shouldn't take too long. Just thinking. So as I said, I am running Cypress directly on my Windows computer, not using WSL because it does run into issues there. If anybody happens to work out how to run Cypress on WSL, please let me know. I would love to stop having to switch back and forward between terminals. Um, come on. It's okay, I'm prepared for live demos. Here's one I prepared earlier. Okay, so we're running the command for Cypress open, if I can spell it properly. And this one will take a while. And what this does is this will then open up the, the Cypress task runner, which as I said, it's given us a bunch to get started with, including a heap of example tests that we can have a look at. So it's given us a bunch of tests to, to start off with. 
but we want to write our own test. So inside of the Cypress folder, inside of the integration folder, we're going to create a new file um, and we're going to call that test.js because naming things is hard. And if we have a look back inside of the Cypress task runner, that has already picked up our new test file that we put there. Now, oh wait, I think that's looping. Okay, so I can go through and have a look at some of the tests that I want to run within Cypress. And they're gonna be looking a little bit like this. Anybody not familiar with tests that look like this? A couple of people? Okay. So what this does is, oh, first of all, the describe lets me know the name of the test that I'm running. Before function is something that will run at the start of the test. And for the before function, I'm letting it Cypress know that I want it to visit the website in the Cypress browser. I'm then giving it an assertion, which I'm saying that the page title, so the meta title, should contain specific text. And to do that, I'm saying CY title, it's a meta title, should contain the text my testing blog. Now, Cypress uses a, a framework called Chai, if you've used it before, for running, running its, writing its tests and assertions. They have a lot of really great documentation on their website about the different options and the functions that you can do with that. What it does is it chains functions together and you write assumptions, things like expect or should, equal or contain and various different functions like that. If you're not familiar with it, they also have a lot of really great tutorial videos to help get you started and get your head around the way the syntax works. Um, so if we have a look at the test that I've got here, we've said visit my blog page and it should contain testing blog in the title go through and have a look. So I've got a couple of tests that I'm running here. Uh, so I'm testing the title and I'm also going to go through and check and make sure that uh, my blog page contains article elements in it. Each of the articles has a title and I want it to make sure that it can click on the article titles and get through to a page from there. So it's going to go through and run my tests, which if I remember correctly, I'm pretty sure this, is fa this should fail. So this visits my web page. It takes a really long time for the image to load because I haven't optimized them very well. So it takes a while to load. It's then going to go through and check that I have blog posts in the feed. And so to do that, I tell it that the feed, and it's gonna, I should really turn loop off on this. No. Yeah. So these, Come on. I wasn't prepared to actually have to use my backups today, um, so they're, they're not working very well. But if we're able to see here, I've got a bunch of different tests similar to, let's just go through and write my tests out so we can actually see them without the video looping through. So here, before we tell it to visit our web page, it should contain my testing blog in the title. I then want it to get the element with a class of feed and find an article element inside of that. Should have at least one blog post in there. I want it to check that each of the articles that it finds should have a heading inside of them. And I want it to find a head, the first heading, get a link inside of that and I want it to click on it and make sure it can go through to the blog post from there. Similar to the other tools that we looked at, you can also go through and define the various viewports or devices that it's testing it on. So you can test it against a mobile screen. So for example, on mobile, I wanted to make sure that my styling's not gone really funky. So I wanted to make sure that the heading 
is still visible and on the page. And you should be able to click on the header to get back to home. Which it's gonna go through and run this test now. So here's the mobile test that we've just gone through. And test the heading should be visible. And it's trying to find the site title, but it didn't find it. Okay. This is when you can also go through and you can have a look at the, the various words. Um, the HTML DOM tree. You can have a look at the HTML elements that are on your page so you can see what it looks like and work out from there why a test should be failing. Okay, so, so far, what have we done? Linting, set that up. Accessibility testing, set that up. Visual regression testing, set that up. End-to-end -end testing, let's pretend we set that up. Let's pretend that actually worked. That's pretty good, that's not bad, right? For an hour talk, we've managed to set up a bunch of tests on our application and we're ready to get started. Now, one type of front-end testing that I did mention at the start is performance testing, which I haven't gone into today, mainly because, you know, the performance of anything on conference Wi-Fi would be horrific and my roaming data probably isn't much better. However, there's a talk that you can go to later on today. Lemon is talking about performance. Uh, by shrinking the web and something about, you know, the meaning of life and how to be happier. So check that out. That's in room two at 5.40 today if you want to find more about performance and performance testing. There are a bunch of other resources out there as well. So NDC last year, Jennifer Wadella gave a talk about Pali. So if you want to find out more information about what you can do with that, her talk is available on YouTube or you may even be able to find Jennifer roaming around the conference. There are also a few other resources. Uh, there's this really great blog post that somebody wrote last year. Um, it's, okay, it's Christmas themed, so it's not really the season anymore, but you may get a kick about kick out of it. So this goes through a few different tips around testing as well as listing a bunch of different testing tools for if any of the ones that I use today don't suit your requirements. There's also another blog post which came out earlier this month as part of JavaScript January, which is getting started on front-end testing. I'll be honest, I wrote that one too. Um, but that basically goes through the tests that I wrote today. So it's a blog post version of the talk with actually working demos so the code actually works. Thank you very much for having me here today. Um, you know, as, as you know, it was an honor for you to have me here today. I will be around the, the rest of the conference. If you have any questions or please feel free to message me on Twitter and you know, tell me my live demos were horrific and I should never do that again or to tell me how I can use Cypress and WSL. That would be amazing. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I do have Australian chocolates here, but if you're still not game enough to ask me a question today, you can find me later. Thank you. Oh.